I've been involved in the water estuary systems like this since I was 15. I started out with my first clam boat at 15, working on weekends in, in the summer from school. And I've watched these estuary systems become dirtier and dirtier because of development. Um, it's, it's the byproduct of all the runoff. And I've thought about this for years, um, that this algae, it's naturally occurring but it's a real opportunistic species. It, it, it has the ability to grow rapidly with very little nutrient. When we throw all this extra nutrient in, it goes wild and it throws the whole system out of balance. We, you know, we started out with this idea, and we believe it's a very good idea, but we went to St. John River Water Management with it and asked them, you know, is this a good idea? Has it been tried before? Um, you know, what do you guys think about this? And what they came back with was they've already identified this as a major problem. They had a lot of research done on it. Um, Troy Rice with the St. John River Water Management um, District, who's the head of the National Estuary Program for this area, he, he's been very helpful with this, and he brought in his science staff, and we talked about it to see if it was worth pursuing. And as we did a little bit more looking into it, we found out that it was pr probably a good technique that's um, worth the effort to, to develop. The EPA has come up with um, guidelines for the states, and the states have passed them down to the local municipalities for reduction of nitrogen phosphorus into these um, estuary systems. At this point in time, there's nothing, tech, there's no technology out there that addresses non-point source discharge, and this does, and it might be possible to fund this through the municipalities and states and other agencies that need to comply as a, as a mechanism for compliance. Because if we remove enough of this, we can bring the equilibrium back into the system where we can balance it back out and have the potential in the future of using it as a resource which could be a revenue generator. What happens with this macroalgae, this being grassalaria, it mats up and it, it creates a, a large accumulation where it, it smothers everything, um, and including itself. And what happens is it'll, it'll create these dead zones where there's no dissolved oxygen, so everything inside these masses dies from lack of oxygen, including itself. The, the perimeter algae keeps growing, but the center of the algae becomes a rotting mass. What we're looking to do with our large-scale equipment is to come in and irrigate those large masses to keep its productivity up because it's secondary habitat, it's important habitat. So if we come in and, and we'll have to figure this out, it might be 20%, it might be 30%, let's come in and clean passages through it which will let water permeate back to the center of the biomass and keep its productivity which will remove more nitrogen and phosphorus from the system and create an environment where more like invertebrates, little crabs, little shrimp can live, we can enhance this habitat too, at the same time removing it as a resource. Um, but we can't just take it to our landfills, because what we'd be doing is taking garbage from one spot and moving it to another. What we have to do is, and work has been done on this, um, Harbor Branch um, in Fort Pierce did a lot of work on it. It does have a potential to make methane gas, which can be run through generators and make electricity that would go right to the grid. When you run this through a methane digester, the sludge that comes out the bottom of it will ha contain the nitrogen and phosphorus that it grew on in a, in a really good usable source. That could be used for soil enhancement. It also, most of the world eats this. We don't in this country, but most of the world uses this for some kind of food product. It could very well be a very good source of food for cattle or maybe even people. So what we need to do is we need to spend a little bit of money right now and find out how can we utilize this and clean the system up and have it generate the income to do the cleanup. The people that get in on the ground floor of this are going to do well because this is a gigantic resource that we've just overlooked. And, and now it's here and we need to remove it, but we also need to use it. Um, that's, that's the whole principle behind this. By removing it from the river or estuary system, we can take a large quantity of nitrogen and phosphorus, which comes from non-point source discharge. And to this point, there's really no technique to remove this, um, this excess nutrient. And in doing so, we can create a resource that can create energy for us or feed for our cattle. Um, this is a great opportunity for us to find a system 
where we can live at the edge of the water and coexist with it. What we have is a, is a basket on the end of a pole, and it's towed from the front of the boat. It's got little skids that keep it off the bottom because the, the drift algae is not rooted to the bottom. It tumbles along the bottom, so we don't really need to be in the bottom. We just put it down on the, like down close to the bottom. It, the boat moves forward, and it catches the macro algaes, which this happens to be Gracilaria. Then it's picked up, and it's dumped into a, a culling tray where we can make sure we eliminate any um, bycatch, like here's a spider crab. That'll all go overboard. It's got a water flow that's uh, washing any mud or a little shrimp or any invertebrates that might be in there overboard. And what we're left with is pretty much just Gracilaria. This is, you know, a great resource. It's a, it's a biomass that can be utilized to create um, methane to electricity. It might be good for cattle feed. Um, and it's got the nitrogen and phosphorus in it that could be used for fertilizers. The algae comes up pretty clean, um, and the water jets help wash off any, um, any bycatch and any bit of muck that's on it. But when we use our full-scale equipment, which is meant to harvest you know, hundreds of thousands of pounds a day, it'll have an open conveyor belt, which will flush all the water and muck out of it. And then the cargo area is an open conveyor belt, too, so all the water will drain. So what we'll be left with is relatively um, light product, which is this algae, and it'll, it'll shed its water real quickly out in the air. What we've done from the beginning, we went to the state agencies to, to get their support and to be able to manage this resource right from the beginning so that it, we could utilize it properly without over-utilizing it. Um, the, and they've been very helpful. We've done some demonstrations for them with uh, Fish and Wildlife, DEP, St. John River Water Management, Bavard Stormwater Management, and they're very supportive and they've given us a commitment that they will issue us a permit to do some research. This algae sucks up the nitrogen and phosphorus, but it has a, a life cycle that's determined by water temperature. And at the end of its cycle, which is usually around August, maybe September, dependent on temperature, it re-releases its nutrient back into the system. When it does that, the, the nutrient load gets higher and higher and higher. So basically what we have is every year we have an elevated level, and, and it's not flushing from these estuaries. And we're probably close to a critical point here. There, there's 102 major estuaries in this country, and almost a third of them are in a point of of endangerment. And when we lose these, it's going to take God knows how long to bring them back. It could take 30, 40 years. If we start right now working on these uh, solutions, we might be able to save these estuaries before they do collapse. It's the vital link between land and the water. It's where everything meets, and it's, it's the most productive habitat on the planet. Um, and if we don't if we don't protect it, we're going to really be uh, we're going to be sorry because it's it's part of what keeps us alive.